have the pleasure today to, to uh, introduce you to Nora Young. And I have a confession to make here. You know, I teach television and I work in the television field, but at home, I don't have the television on that often. I almost always, though, have the radio on. Um, and I find sometimes this is because radio just gives you the most intriguing and interesting approaches to, uh, to basically intellectual stuff. So Nora is the host, Nora Young is the host of the CBC radio show Spark, which is a show about technology and society. And you know, as a video producer, I'm always listening to her show and thinking, well, how could you illustrate that with video and, and with visuals? And yet I find that sometimes presenting the latest in technology and society works really well on radio because the medium forces the people of Spark to look a little deeper into the impact of technology. Nora Young always impresses me with her thoughtful, considered approach, so I was really pleased when she agreed to prepare some remarks for us today. Nora plans to talk to about half an hour, 45 minutes, and then we're going to leave the floor open for discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, Nora Young. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andy, and thank you for uh, inviting me to be, uh, to be here. Uh, I speak to educators a fair bit, but of course it's a particular treat to be able to talk to people who are um, educating the next generation of um, media professionals. It's actually interesting what you said about um, doing a show about technology on the radio. We learned pretty early on that it's actually really boring to talk about technology on the radio. <laughs> so that meant that we started out by um, by really focusing on the effects of media and the effects of technology rather than on the, um, the specs. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, the hardship has actually worked in our, um, <coughs> in our benefit. Now when I talk to people um, coming out of J school or radio and TV or broadcasting, I sense both the anxiety and the enthusiasm that people have. And um, it's, a, you know, it's an exciting time and it's a scary time. And I would really love to get your um, analysis and your responses and your feedback because uh, it helps me do the, the work I do, so I'm really interested in, in the, the conversation part as opposed to just the one-way uh, broadcast. Um, personally, I'm kind of in the midway point between the older world of uh, media and the new world of media. Um, in 2002, I voluntarily left the show that I had started before, DNTO, on CBC, which was the only broadcasting job I'd ever had. Um, I was tired of it, and I needed some new challenges, and so I left, and I found myself outside of the sort of uh, comforting embrace of the mother corp and in this new world of citizen journalism and social media. Um, and I saw how scary that could be as the old sort of security eroded, but I also saw that there was something pretty uh, exciting and stimulating in this new information and new media environment. Um, so while I think, you know, as we look forward to the next generation, it's a scary time. I think it's also a really exciting time. And I think the creative opportunities are probably greater than they um, have ever been. So I went from that experience and I took what I learned in that environment to pitch um, CBC on this show, Spark, which was a show that I hoped would um, take the values of public broadcasting and um, express them in a 21st century way. To, to sound like what 21st century media feels like and to specifically speak to the new media environment in the content of the show, yeah, but also in the sound of the show and the ethic of the show where we would try and bridge the professional media and the amateur um, and have it really expressed in the way the show sounded and felt and um, organized itself. And since then, the show's been on the air for four seasons. It's continued to be this tumultuous time for broadcast, but I think What's happened that I think is really exciting is it's almost like the first wave of chaotic sky is falling stuff has, has happened and now we're finally starting to get a, a little bit of a handle on what the new information environment looks like if we don't yet quite know what our place uh, in it is. I think that we're in the early stages of a new and evolving uh, ecosystem of information. You know, the internet and especially Web 2.0 is changing what it means for how we create um, and understand and share information. And as you guys are all on the front lines of dealing with that, and as I say, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. So what I'd like to do this morning is just take a look from, you know, very big picture. I'm a technology journalist. I'm not a, an educator. Um, sort of a 10 stories high up look at the new rules of the game, that what this new ecosystem of information, sort of big picture. And then come back to what I think that means for people who want to be great at media. Because I think that's what we have to think about now. I think um, there's not so much of the low-hanging fruit now. We have to teach the next generation to become great at media and great at meaning. 
And uh, I'll sprinkle that through with a little bit of what we've grappled with on my show, Spark, not because I at all think we have all the answers, but just because it's an example of what I think we all have to start to do, which is to pretty radically rethink narrative and storytelling to fit in with this new information environment. Um, but to get to that point, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and take seriously just how, um, how big a picture uh, we're looking at in terms of the changes to the new ecosystem of information. And so with that in mind, I'd actually like to play you a short bit of archival uh, audio. And this is actually from when uh, direct dial telephones first came into use, when you had to actually dial the phone yourself rather than going through the operator. And it sounds kind of funny now, but there was a time when they actually had to have public service announcements to explain to people how to do this. Here are a few important suggestions for the use of your dial telephone. Before calling any number, first secure the number from your new directory. Then remove the receiver and listen for the dial tone. It sounds like this. That tone indicates everything is ready for your call. With the receiver off the hook, dial each numeral in this manner, pulling the dial around to the finger stop each time. Be sure to allow the dial to freely return to its normal position. Got that? <laughs> So, I mean, obviously it's hard for us to imagine a time when you actually had to teach people how to use a telephone, right? When it wasn't a completely obvious and transparent thing, uh, you know, how you use it, but also what the social rules around it are, right? But of course there was a time when the telephone had to be explained to people. And this happens all the time when there's new media of communication that come in, like the telephone. It's not just a technical thing, it's a social thing. You, it changes the culture and there are always these tussles as we try and figure out how we're going to adapt to um, this new technology, what the norms are around it, what the social rules are, what's gained and what's lost. And, and with the phone actually, they went through this period where people debated what you should do when you pick the thing up. Because if you've never done that before, like it's not obvious, right? What do you do when you pick this thing up? And they toyed with a bunch of different responses. Um, for a while they thought about saying, what is wanted? Or another one was ahoy. And then finally they settled on hello as kind of the term that we would all use. But it was actually something that people had to think about. What, what, what are the norms that govern that? Um, I have to say in retrospect, I think I would prefer to be on a bus where everybody's picking up their cell phones and saying ahoy. It might be a little more <laughs> entertaining. But my point is I think we're at this point with this new ecosystem of information, right? Increasingly at least, and this is an important caveat for people who have um, access to broadband and access to the internet. Um, we know what the technical protocols are, you know, we know how to use this stuff, but we haven't really figured out the ahoy or hello stuff, the cultural stuff that lies below that. And I think, you know, that's why we're sort of, it's no surprise that we're struggling with all of this stuff because it's a huge change. Um, you know, this uh, year, 2011, is the uh, 100th anniversary of Marshall McLuhan's uh, birth. And McLuhan wrote The Gutenberg Galaxy in 1962, nearly 50 years ago. And I think that as we come up on nearly 50 years after that book was written, we're really starting to understand kind of what he meant, which is that the mode of communication shapes the way we understand the world around us. Um, you know, he understood profoundly that Western society was shaped by the evolution of print and that it was being remade by electric and electronic communication. And I think that we may be only getting to the point 50 years on where we're really understanding what was meant by the idea of the global village and how thoroughly and radically it's reshaping how we think and how we communicate. Um, and that's, you know, that means that there are big changes for all of us who are essentially working in that way of teaching people how to communicate. So um, what I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about how I see the information climate right now. Um, and as we go through this, maybe keeping in the back of your minds what you think is crucial in terms of what you teach your students. You know, how do the narrative tools, the way you approach story, need to change in response to this changing information environment. So the first change, I think, is the notions of who and what is an authority. So social media obviously radically de de democratizes who can be a creator of information and a generator of information in a pretty meaningful way. Um, this isn't new, um, but I think we're actually at the point of just really kind of coming to understand what that means, right? Where we're seeing flourishing of online media that are radically more perspectival, that come from a lot of different points of view, where none of them can really make an absolute claim to being uh, absolutely authoritative. And the potential here is, of course, for a profoundly more democratic idea of truth, 
uh, an opportunity to bring many more people to the table. But the danger is, of course, that everything just becomes a matter of opinion once you throw out uh, rigor and um, you know authority and credentialism and so forth. So there's a lot of potential there, but also a lot of risk. So. Obviously, this broadening of who has a platform has big implications for anyone who does the kind of stuff that we do. But here's the interesting thing, and I've been thinking about this for a little while, that maybe there are signs that um, we're actually trying to find now what I call hubs of credibility. So that it's not just a mass of noise of all these different perspectives, each of which are equal, that we're actually trying to find nodes or ways of getting more credible um, and reliable information, partly just because there's such an unbelievable sea of uh, data and information. So examples of the way we're trying to create these hubs of credibility, almost spontaneously or in a bottom-up way, are things like Quora or Hunch, which are websites that use actual human beings to filter information and give um, search results and, um, and give um, sophisticated answers to questions, so real human filters or um, social filters that use who you know as a way of getting access to better information, or even just highly skilled and well-respected bloggers who aren't necessarily connected with an institution, but who, in virtue of having uh, credibility and authority that comes from themselves, are able to be these hubs of credibility. Uh, there's a contributor to my show, Spark, named Anand, er, Anand Girdardas, who's also a, t a columnist for the New York Times. And he just had a really, really interesting column about this the other day that spoke to this exact issue. Um, and he suggests that there's, there's a reset happening after the first wave, you know, through the first decade of the 21st century, where we just said, you know, to hell with authority, forget it. <laughs> I'm getting my news off of Twitter, to actually um, kind of coming back to thinking of how we can have some, some credibility. And he used the example of um, Swift River. Does anyone know Swift River here? Okay, so there's this really amazing project called Ushahidi, which came out of um, Kenya after the post-election violence sprung up in uh, Kenya several years ago. And the idea was to give people a way to uh, cheaply and easily document evidence of post-election violence that they saw. So it let people send little text messages documenting what they saw that would then be plotted uh, on a, a continually updated map. And it was a way of sort of um, documenting the history and gathering evidence for the history. And it's been very successful. It's been used um, for elections in India and um, in the United States uh, to monitor election irregularities. It was used after the uh, disaster in Haiti. It's been a huge success story. But one of the problems, um, and this is something that Anand documents, is that, of course, you have a lot of misinformation or a lot of wrong information or malicious, malicious information. So what they've tried to do is then put on this other layer called Swift River which tries to uh, sort out good information from bad. And it partly uses human insight, and it partly uses algorithms to try to create, again, this idea of hubs of credibility. So it's not just noise, it's not just spontaneity. And what I think is so interesting about that is that they're trying to harness the power of the web, which is immediate, which is real time, which is way more instant than you know, which is crowdsourced and way more instant than anybody could do by being um, a, a typical authority than by being a journalist or by being even the Red Cross in those disaster situations. But it's also applying another layer of filtering to it. So it's both relying on the spontaneity of the web but bringing back this idea of um, hubs of credibility. Um, the second thing I think defines this, this idea is basically, <laughs> like they always say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's the socialization of information. So. The corollary of this idea of the collapse of authority is that information literacy is really strongly connected to social literacy and connectedness. So as we start to see you know, social search and social information be the way, one of the ways that people find these hubs of credibility, having a trusted network of friends makes a big difference. A lot of people these days you know, get their information through Facebook or they get their information through Twitter. That's how they assume that things are going to find them. But if you're a person who has a really great, smart, well-connected group of friends on Facebook who are sharing all sorts of links and providing all sorts of context to the news, that's great. But what if you're a person who's quite socially isolated, who doesn't have access to that? Um, you know, you may still have uh, access to the CBC or the local newspaper or whatever, but you are largely shut off from those sort of social forms of information. And so I think when we think as uh, media people about how do we use these kind of social tools, I mean most 
shows on CBC certainly have a Facebook page and have a Twitter feed and so forth. I think we have to think about how we can be in those social spaces to provide credible information for people who want it, whether they have their own independent source of all these really well-connected friends or not. We can be in those spaces like Facebook and be providing access to, to, cred to be those cr uh, hubs of credibility that I talked about. Um, and, and I think the, what that implies for people who are in media is that we don't just think about what we're doing as pushing information out there. You know, I think a lot of media, whether it's in the broadcast form or whether it's on Twitter or whether it's on Facebook, just think about in terms of like it's promotion, it's pushing the information out there, it's pushing the information out there. But I think if we're going to be these credible sources of information, we need to understand ourselves as parts of these new ecosystems, as really nested within them, as nested as part of social media, as cred, cred I'm really in problems with that phrase, hubs of credibility within um, this broader ecosystem. And recognize that, you know, Spark or a newspaper or whatever may be a hub of credibility, but it also exists in keeping with other hubs of credibility who maybe are, you know, not professional journalists, maybe they're scientists, maybe they're lay people with just an incredible passion and uh, knowledge about a particular subject. And we have to start teaching, I think, our next generation of media people to really participate more thoroughly and in a more egalitarian way in those um, ecosystems. Um, and I think what that socialization of information Im implies is this the idea of a kind of collaborative or consensual idea of truth. So whether we're talking formally about using a wiki or social networking sites or just social media generally, what the web 2.0 means is that the contribution of an individual is often not as important as the sum of all points of view together. Um, and to give you an example of what I mean by that, if you think about something like somebody's Facebook profile, that sounds like a thing that's all about you, right? It's my Facebook profile, here's my picture, here's my profile, what I choose to say about myself. But the reality of this new information ecology is that you're not just who you say you are on Facebook. You are who you say you are, plus the list of friends you have, plus their profiles, plus what they choose to write about you on your wall, plus the photos that they unfortunately tag of you. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I mean, is when you're thinking about this ecosystem, it's not just that um, you know, I say what the truth is or I say what I think things mean. Meaning is generated in this much more kind of collaborative, um, interactive, kind of webby sort of way. And you know, I think we tend to think of writing from a sustained and single point of view as a natural thing, but in a large measure, that's a product of the world of print. We were talking about McLuhan earlier, and that, that's sort of the, the invention of print, is this, the linear text and the singular point of view. But what we're starting to see in a lot of areas is how people can harness the generation of information in this highly collaborative kind of way. And it's not just happening in social media, and it's not just happening in uh, mainstream media either. It's happening in um, how science is done. For instance, you have movements like the, the open science movement, which is taking what was once a pretty secretive process, scientific research, and opening it up, where scientists are saying, hey, here's my data, sharing the data widely. Maybe if everybody looks at the data, we can advance uh, scientific discovery more quickly rather than me holding on to my data and waiting to publish it in a peer-reviewed journal two years from now. So I think when we think about do what doing media means in this world, I think it also means that we have to think about how we can be more open about, um, about how, we, um, how we do that practice in, in our own work. So for instance, um, on Spark, we try as much as possible to um, blog about the stories that we're doing before we do them. So even when they're just a germ in our, you know, in our minds and we haven't really thought a lot about how we're going to tell the story, we're very open about it, we blog about it, and we get um, responses from our most engaged community members who give us story ideas, who say, that's a really stupid idea for a story, who say, why don't you talk to this person, or that's fine, but you've left this out of count. Um, and then, when we're really organized, which is not always, but when we're really organized, we take the questions that um, our audience members give us. I will include them in interviews that I do with my um, guests. Then we post the full unedited interviews online. And then the um, most engaged members of the community comment on those interviews. And then the whole shebang can be included in the final product that goes on the air um, once a week. So that you have. This is what I mean by the idea of broadcasting, including um, the content, the aesthetic, and the ethics of, the, of this new information ecology. So 
when you hear Spark broadcast, you hear the multiple levels of conversation and collaboration, right? That we got the story idea from community members, we blogged about it, the questions in um, the interview, some of them are by the audience members. The response to the edited interview contains uh, the comments on the raw interview by the guests. So it's a way of incorporating all these multiple, uh, multiple lines. And we're pretty um, open about the fact that, you know, we get a lot of our best ideas from our audience members. I'd just like to play you one example of, um, of how we do that. Um, Actually, I won't. I'll, I'll wait for a second. Um, but we try to um, make it as entertaining and as natural as possible to talk about um, how the audience participates in the show. Um, another example that I want to get to, which is this idea of blurring lines of true and false. Okay? We talk a lot about media literacy, but I think an implication of this idea that we don't always know where information is coming from is that it's harder to evaluate what's true and what's false. And this brings us back to the point of hubs of credibility again. Not so much that we're going back to the world of old school hierarchical authority, but um, that we need help in discerning what is um, accurate information. So an ex as an example of that, I want to play you just a little bit of a YouTube video. Have you seen this video? Go for it. Okay, that device you see plugged into the iPhone, that's my video transmitter. Now this is my video repeater. Basically it takes any video signal coming out of the iPhone and it boosts it, it enhances it. And I can take over any other video signal that I want that I put this close to. So what we're filming on the iPhone right now, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna put on one of these screens. I'm gonna give you a demonstration of how this works. Good? Yeah? Yeah, got it. All right. iPhone and you broadcast it on the billboards in Times Square, right? Um, except that you can't do that. That's impossible, right? And what this video actually is, is an ad for that movie, uh, Limitless, where people take a pill and they suddenly become super smart, right? But this video was hugely popular with people who thought, holy cow, all I need is to figure out how to hack my iPhone and I can take over all the billboards all over my downtown streets. Um, and if you look at this video, it has, it's very cleverly done. It has a lot of those little keys that we assume that we're gonna find on a rough and ready homemade thing, right? It's got the jumpy cam, it's got the loose cuts, it's posted to YouTube, it looks very homemade, right? And it looks credible, it's got all that, you know, for a lot of our lives, we're told that that kind of first person raw address is, is the sign of something that's real and raw and true. And now we see, if you think about somebody who's growing up now, how sophisticated you have to be about media and how to read media messages in order to see something like that think critically about it and think, wait a minute, I think something weird is going on here and then investigate that and research it and figure out if that's possible and what is this really advertising and so forth. So my point is that um, once you sort of break down those old ideas of authority and hierarchy, it becomes a lot harder to tell what is true and false and what's just true for now. Um, and I think for broadcasters, one of the main lessons of doing that is that we've got to stop pretending that we know everything all the time and pretending that we are the sort of wall of authority um, and everything is perfect and everything is live and everything is seamless. Because I think, paradoxically, it's only when we break down that idea, that sheen of absolute authority, that we can actually become those hubs of credibility, that we can actually become really trusted because we're transparent and we're speaking really honestly to the people that we, um, to our constituencies, the people that we meet. So in Spark, we try to do this. And one of the ways that we try to do this is, is by what we call letting the scenes show, um, which means we just, we broadcast parts of interviews and things that normally would end up on the cutting room floor. 
And we do that partly because we think it's entertaining, but also because we want to be really clear about the fact that this isn't live. This is, in some sense, manipulated reality. And we want to, be, we want to make that part of the aesthetic of what we show, that the show is a distillation of a lot of stuff that's gone on over the course of the week. So here's an example of something that we did on Spark as a way of um, playing with that in a, in a sort of playful way. So the other day, I was here in the Spark studio, and we just dialed up another radio studio in Pittsburgh. The plan was to interview Jesse Schell. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Hi, it's Nora in Toronto. I am not hearing anything. I can't hear you, Jesse. No, usually in these situations, I just keep right on talking. I say, hello. Hello, Jesse. Or I recite the alphabet backwards. Z, Y, X, W, V. And I wait for those magic words. Connected. Let's hear Let's see okay. if we can hear him now. But I wasn't expecting what I heard next. Hello? <laughs> Is that Jesse? <laughs> it was Jesse Shell, and appropriately enough, he was playing the harmonica. I say appropriately enough because play is a big part of Jesse's world. Are you getting him now? He's a game designer and a professor. I teach game design at the Carnegie Mellon Entertainment Technology Center, and I'm the CEO of Shell Games. So that's just a little example of what we try and do on Spark. And I, again, I don't say that because I think that everyone needs to start including sections of people playing the harmonica on their shows, but just as a way of thinking about what that means for how you tell stories, right? What that means for how you fit into this changing ecosystem where there are many voices, where it's hard to know what's true and false. And I think that idea of being transparent and showing the seams um, and being just essentially more human in how you do your broadcast is an important part of doing that. Um, I think another implication of this idea of uh, changing information is uh, fluid information flows. You know, when do you, um, or when is it time to, to put a fork in it? So I think this idea, this collaborative, highly fluid idea, uh, means that our sense of when a document is done, or when a newscast is done, or when any kind of media report is done, when it's true rather than when it's true for now or done for now, is very fluid in a way that it has never been before. So if you think about something like Wikipedia, when do you say that a definition on Wikipedia is true or done? It's, it's always subject to change and evolution. Or something like Twitter, the whole point of it is to be continually in process. The, the very point of the information is process. And this, I think, is a really radically new thing, where you're getting beyond just saying, you know, the 24-hour news cycle, which we used to talk about, you know, when I was first coming up, of like constantly updating information. We're getting to a point where the actual the actual point of the information is to say what is happening right now, not to give context around it. So this is both um, good in the sense of continually updated live information, but also I think quite scary for anybody who is looking for things like context or uh, confirmation or certainty. Um, and I think that's a huge challenge for people who are broadcasters, is how do you walk the line between um, the continual fluid updating of information and holding on to your credibility and your, um, your, your claims to truth. Certainly in my world, in the technology world, in the blogosphere, if you had to, I mean, everyone wants to be accurate, but in the blogosphere, if people had to make an, a choice between being first or being absolutely sure you're right, first, I think, would always trump right. Whereas in traditional broadcasting, that's, that's not the case, at least as far as I'm concerned. So that, I think, is a real interesting challenge for us as broadcasters is how do, we, how do we balance the desire for being continually in process and continually updating with this idea to provide certainty and to provide context. Um, I think another idea is, that we have to think about with this new ecology of information is uh, the signal to noise ratio. You know, how do we search and filter in an era when there is just so, so much information? It's kind of hard to believe that we used to think of um, you know, an era when there were websites that you had to read as being like information overflow, because now it's, you know, it's IMs and chats and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And so as I suggested, we're starting to have all of these ways of trying to wrangle this information and bring it into some type of um, a form or shape. So we have human filters, we have social search, we have something called the semantic web, which is sort of in the offing, which is trying to give another layer of um, information to our searches, we have the real-time web, we have all these ways of trying to filter and wrangle our information. And a danger of that, I think, 
is what's called the problem of homophily, which is something that's been identified by um, Ethan Zuckerman and others, which is that once you start to filter by who you know, or filter by geography, um, or filter by your connections on Facebook, you run the risk of like uh, looking for like, so that you don't seek out alternate sources of information, you end up getting a little echo chamber of confirming your, your opinions. And I think this is an interesting challenge for, um, for anyone in media, which is how do we sort of break out of that? How do we stand as these um, credible bodies within this broader ecosystem of information, but still give people an opportunity to access different um, different types of information, different viewpoints. Because I think that the tendency in a way is going a little bit the other way towards these sort of self-reinforcing forms of information. Um, another thing that I think, I don't know how this really plays out in terms of um, broadcasting, but I think it's an interesting observation about media, which is the idea of the death of nuance. Um, you know, when we deal with each other online, as opposed to face-to-face, -to -face, there's an enormous amount that gets filtered out, right? When you can't see the look in somebody's eyes, you can't see if they're nervous because they're speaking in front of a group of people or whatever, you can't see the nuances that come with gesture and dress and so on. Um, and a lot of social media are, are oriented around getting information out of people in very particular ways, generating lists. You know, a person's Facebook profile, for instance, consists of preferences and lists. And what I wonder with that is once we start list, once we start um, trying to find out about each other through what the technology does well, which is lists and preferences, do we leave out of count all of those sort of nuanced things that come from being face-to-face -face or that come from, um, you know, describing ourselves rather than listing our top ten movies and so forth. Um, and you can see how this is happening in social search too, where social search relies on this creation of sets of lists. You know, the other day, I, um, I followed the recommendation of my colleague, Dan Meisner, about um, where I should go for lunch. He suggested, <coughs> excuse me, why don't you go to Ravi Soup for lunch? And, you know, I like Dan, but I wouldn't really call him a friend. He's more of a workplace buddy. Um, so you might think he's kind of the equivalent of somebody that I would know through a social network, one of these weak ties. Except that because Dan and I inhabit the same workplace, he knows a lot of nuanced things about me that he probably isn't even aware that he's ever absorbed, you know? he knows that I'm cheap, he knows that I'm a vegetarian, he knows how far I'm willing to walk, how much time it usually takes me to eat my lunch, and so on. So he can make a recommendation to me that is really suitable, but not because he knows my set of lists and preferences, but because he know, has a nuanced understanding of who I am as a, as a person. You know, somebody who knew all that stuff about me that I knew on Twitter would, you know, probably be a stalker, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so what do we have then? Um, that we have to deal with as media people. We have this kind of McLuhanite information ecosystem, this collaborative, webby, highly social, highly fluid approach to information that's affecting everything like how you make a contemporary radio show to how libraries are organized to how you educate uh, people. And it's really been an extraordinary amount of change. Um, and I think you know people are starting to talk about this as analogous to the move from uh, print to electric culture or from uh, oral culture to print culture and I think that's actually apt. Um, and I think what some of that means for us in terms of the way we think about organizing content and narrative approaches, we have to think about ways that we can not just <clears throat> push out our same old way of doing things but how we can be nested in this new ecosystem in a way that is meaningful, that provides credibility, that provides um, consistency, that provides context but also that understands it not in the old way, that understands that there are other sources of credible information, that understands that the requirement is that it is uh, fluid, that people are maybe more tolerant of things that aren't necessarily 100% factually certain yet, and so forth. Um, and I think you know, broadcast media all too often have ended up using social media, but using it in the same way that we used traditional media. You know, we have blogs, we have Twitter, we've got Facebook, but we use it essentially as a promotional tool, as a way of pushing out uh, information and not really thinking more creatively about how it changes the way we do what we do, right? We read, you know, tweets on the air, but is that really substantively any different than just playing, you know, voicemails that came into the Vox box or whatever? I think the bar is actually set way higher. Uh, if, if we take this idea of a new information ecosystem seriously, 
you have to really radically rethink the way you're using those tools and the way you're telling those stories. Um, so these are the challenges for the next generation, which is changing um, the way they tell stories to reflect, reflect the new ecology of information, but also changing their uh, relationship to this, uh, the traditional institutions. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, I talk to students who come to me who are just out of J school or they're just looking for their first job, and I can see how scared they are. I can see that they want a job and they want um, an institution to take them in and give them that full-time job. And of course, that's a completely understandable thing. But I think in a way, what better serves those um, students or those new graduates is if they think of themselves entrepreneurially and if they think of themselves independent of the institutions that they come from or that they may be going into as those hubs of credibility and how they as individuals can swim in that new ecosystem of information, which is perhaps not a very, um, you know, comforting thing to tell, you know, a 22 year old who's just out in the work world, but I think it's a more realistic thing to tell them. Um, and I think that the, the good aspect of that is that you can be a source of credibility and you can be powerful in this new information ecosystem in a way that you couldn't outside of an institution uh, a generation ago. So I'd just like to do a tiny bit of um, future casting to talk a little bit about, I think, where we're going. Oops. Um, and I think if we look at this sort of last 10 years as kind of the first wave of social information, I think the next five years are going to be taking, taking us um, to a level of really ubiquitous information. And again, with a caveat that um, you know, some people uh, don't have access to information, not only internationally, but here at home. I think that what we're looking at is a future where meaning is being created everywhere. It's being continually updated. Much of it is created and shared by uh, users specific to specific ge um, uh, geographical locations. We're seeing the rise of the mobile web. The fact that more and more of us have access to the internet on phone or even text message on phone is making information more ubiquitous all the time. Um, you know, the, the designer Adam Greenfield has used this great expression, mobiquity to talk about this idea that we're going into a future where you're just gonna be able to assume that information is available wherever you are, whenever you are, you know, like a light switch that you turn on. It's not something that's connected to your computer. It's not something that's connected to, a, you know, a news broadcast at the top of the clock. It's just available, it's on your phone, et cetera. And this is affecting things internationally too. I mean, there are now around five billion cell phones in the world. 300, 350 million people in China alone access the web primarily through their phones. Um, in Africa, uh, technological innovation using text message has made it possible to do things like pay for things and transfer money using phones because cell phones, not smartphones, but regular smell, uh, cell phones are extraordinarily uh, widespread uh, in Africa and more so all the time. The greatest number of cell phone subs subscribers is now in the developing world, not the developed world. So that's an example, I think, of how we're moving towards this idea of continually updated information in our environment that's with you all the time. Um, you know, and you can see how this is happening, uh, not even in terms of cell phones, but just in terms of how it's spread out in your environment around you. Um, in my hometown of Toronto, in downtown Toronto, they've started this pilot project on the Bathurst Street uh, streetcar, where there's a little LED screen on the, um, the streetcar stop that tells you when the next streetcar is gonna come. And the reason it can do that is because it's continually updated with information from the streetcar, which is um, connected to GPS. So it can deliver you, deliver you just-in-time information about not what the streetcar s schedule says, but where the streetcar actually is. Um, and that's an example of what we're gonna start to see more and more in the next um, five years or so as we start to have information, not just about the streetcar schedule, but about the weather, about the subway routes, about um, your, your train schedules, your road schedules, all this kind of stuff. And so I think the question to ask for anybody who's involved in broadcasting is, you know, this is just starting now, but it's gonna take off in the next five years. So if your broadcasting model relies on telling people what the traffic is on the roads today, or what the weather's supposed to be like today. I mean, that's valuable information now. Is it still gonna be valuable information in five years when most people are gonna be able to find out uh, not only what the traffic is like today, but what the traffic is like on their particular route that they're gonna to take to work? Or 
when um, you know my weather update doesn't just tell me what the weather's going to be like in Toronto, it tells me what the weather's going to be like in Toronto and Victoria because it knows I'm traveling today. So those are, the I think, the real challenges when you start to think ahead about where that ubiquitous data is taking us. Um, and this is happening very, very quickly. Last year, uh, New York City appointed its first ever uh, chief digital officer. And uh, I wish we had one of those. I wish I could be one of those, actually. <laughs> um, and their mission is really to open up New York City data. And they're doing this in this fabulous way of just making stuff publicly available to, um, to citizens. They have um, the, um, the City Works Committee has a blog called uh, The Daily Pothole where they just, they have a little pothole update about what's going on every day and it shows you pictures and maps of the potholes that they're fixing and they have names for the potholes and so on. Um, so what I'm suggesting is, and I mean, what, what is, you know, the New York City government, that's a hub of credibility, certainly, right? It's a source of uh, good authoritative information. But it's just so much easier to get data out there and to get it to people wherever they are. To get it on their smartphone, sure, but to get it to them as a cheap text message as well. So you have to ask yourself, in five years, when hopefully all municipal governments are doing the kind of stuff that uh, New York City is doing, giving those constant updates, maybe making it possible for people to report to them where potholes are, getting updates on whether their potholes have been fixed, all that kind of stuff. If that's everywhere out there, what does that mean for what your students are going to need to be doing? They, they, they can't document pothole fixing better than you know, New York City government can do it. So they have to start thinking about what, what are the things that they can contribute that maybe the New York City uh, government can contribute. Um, on Spark a while ago, we covered the story of two high school chemistry teachers uh, in rural Colorado, and they had this clever idea. Instead of bringing their students together for their lecture in the classroom and then assigning them homework to do on their own, they decided to pull a switcheroo. So what they started doing was giving them the lectures as homework, which they would make available as a podcast or on um, DVD or whatever. And they made sure every student had the technical ability to connect to this. And then in the classroom, they started essentially doing their homework. So they would do their homework together. And this allowed the students to, or the teachers rather, to find out when students were having trouble much more quickly because they could actually see how they were um, solving the problems. And it also avoided the trouble that they had before, which was that the students were doing their homework with each other over IM. They weren't actually doing their homework on their own anyway. So um, I think that point is that it seems natural to us to have a lecture in the classroom and assign homework at home because that's the way we've always done it and because that's a way of doing things that came about when we ha had a scarcity of access to information, right? When you had to be in the same physical space to get um, the information delivered from the teacher to the student. But if we're in this world where information is increasingly ubiquitous, we have to think about what is the scarce resource. The scarce resource isn't the data, the information. The scarce re resource is the meaning and the context. So for in the case of a teacher, it's not the communication of the lecture. It's the communication of the wisdom that comes through the exploration. That's the scarce resource. And this is what I mean by this ahoy hello business, right? That we, once you start thinking, what's that ahoy, aho, ahoy hello level beneath it, you can start to think, wait a minute, am I still you know, doing media, doing teaching, based on an idea of what was a scarce resource, which is no longer a scarce resource, when the scarce resource now is my wisdom and my ability to create meaning and context for people. So uh, what does all this mean for broadcasters and educators and students? Um, I think that what it means, is, first of all, is as I suggested, that the idea of mainstream media is something that just contributes straight information is uh, not dead yet, but it's definitely not a growth industry. Um, you know, in technology, we have this pyramid idea that we talk about, which is D-I-K-W. So the bottom level of the pyramid is data, above that is information, above that is knowledge, and above that is wisdom. And I think for a long time, because we were existing in conditions of scarcity of information, media could do, they could live pretty much on the bottom part of the pyramid, right? There was a lot of space on the bottom of the pyramid to be, um, not data, but to take data and turn it into information, right? And to give those traffic updates and do all that stuff. Um, but what I think what we see now is, especially going forward into this ubiquitous data environment, is that suddenly the bottom layers 
of the pyramid where journalism used to be, that's inhabited by you know the daily pothole and by the person on Twitter that you follow who's obsessed with restaurants in your hometown and so forth, right? So the, the challenge is to live where the information is scarce, which is in knowledge and in wisdom at the top of that pyramid, which is a scary place to be, right? It's, you can't be mediocre in the knowledge and wisdom top part of the platform, or the pyramid, rather. Um, I think what that also means, in addition to not being mediocre, is it means that the standards that students are going to be held to, if they want to be those hubs of credibility, if they want to be trusted, and if they want to be trusted outside of the institution that gives them the, the good housekeeping seal of approval, is that the, the standards of transparency and honor and accountability and accuracy are actually higher than they used to be. Because as somebody coming out, you might not necessarily have, or at least not always have, the CBC or you know the Globe and Mail or the Star or whoever being your you know your voice of authority that gives you that credibility. So you have to. I mean, I think the challenge is actually way, um, way steeper for people who are coming out now because they have to, in some ways, express that themselves. Um, I think a really good example of somebody who is doing journalism really well in this climate is Matthew Ingram. Matthew's a technology writer. He used to be the senior technology writer at the Globe and Mail. So, you know, really, really nested in that institution. He's about my age, so came up in the era of, you know, where the institution gives you your authority. But over time, he's established so much credibility as a, per as a blogger, as a person on Twitter, and so on, as a source of authority, that when something big happens in the technology world, you go to Matthew Ingram. You don't go to Matthew Ingram because of his connection with the Globe and Mail. And in fact, he left the Globe and Mail. He's now the senior writer for GigaOM, which is a technology blog, which in itself says something about the changing media climate. Um, but he's a good example of somebody who has worked really hard to be transparent and credible. And it's really worked for him. You know, can everyone be as successful as that? Maybe not, but I think that's where the benchmark is. He's uh, Matthew I with one T on Twitter, if you want to find him. Um, but I think the good thing is, and this is the sort of more exciting part, is that if you're good at what you do, I think it really does offer a lot of potential to be somebody like Matthew, to be somebody who has, um, has a lot of credibility. Because in that pyramid, that D-I-K-W pyramid, you know, you, you can't replace intellectual and, and social capital and creative capital. That's a scarce resource. And if you have that, then, um, then I think you're in an, an actually a good position. Um, and as educators, I think one thing to think about are what are those ahoy, hello moments that you can encourage your students to have, right? Those questions that, like those two teachers in Colorado, got them to think, why am I doing this thing the way I'm doing it? Why am I telling this story the way I'm telling it? Am I telling a story at the bottom of the pyramid or am I telling a story at the top of the pyramid? How am I creating meaning? How am I creating value? Um, and how am I still doing it with those same values of you know, suspense and empathy and tension that have been fueling great storytelling since we were all sitting around the campfire. Um, personally, I'm actually excited about the future. I think that we might not really have a profession that's called journalist or broadcast professional uh, in 10 years, so maybe even in five years. But I think there's always going to be a place for people who can wrangle information, who can turn data and information into knowledge and hopefully wisdom, and who can um, give people context. It's a challenging time, but I think it's really exciting, too. Um, we're really at, I think, that ahoy or hello moment, that moment where we're starting to grapple with all of the, the messy under stuff that goes with that. And it's a powerful place to be, and I look forward to seeing how you bring your, uh, your challenge uh, to bear and uh, bring your skill to, to answer it. So thank you very much. questions now and, and Nora I'd ask you when somebody asks the question for the camera if you could just repeat the question sure, so yeah. we know what it is. So hands up everybody don't be too anxious now. <laughs> Jeff go ahead. Uh, Nora I, I, you may be I, mean, I know you're familiar with this story most people in the room probably are but in the last week or two the TDSB Toronto District School Board was talking about the, the questioning the survival of libraries. And um, I guess my question to you would be, in, on the basis of what you've just been speaking about, and access to information and where the databases are being created, what's the future of the library, the place that we go to, you know, for resources, for a, 
uh, in a sense, to commune or to collect with people who are seeking information. Yeah. So the question is, what is the future of the library, uh, especially in the context where schools are closing school libraries all the time? Um, yeah, I, I was really disturbed by that. I didn't realize that there were whole provinces where there are no school librarians, actually. Um, and I think part of that comes from people confusing um, the library with the book and with paper. Um, I think that really, and I speak to librarians a lot, and I think if you look at what librarians are doing, they're those information wranglers par excellence, right? They're the people who are taking that bottom level, the, especially the data and the information, and really, they're, I mean, they're not, they're not creating narrative the way we are, but they're helping to filter out the, the bad information from the good information, and I think, you know, as I suggested with that YouTube video, really the standards of media literacy and um, questioning what you see around you and the ability to discern online what is good information and what is not good information. I'd be really interested to hear what you observe with your students about their ability to tell good information from bad information online. Um, you know, that's more important than ever. And I actually hear a lot from, from teachers too, you know, high school teachers or whatever, who say, I would love to do this media literacy stuff, but I don't, first of all, I, do, I don't feel qualified, and second, um, I don't have time, and they've fired all our teacher librarians, right? So I, to me, it's incredibly short-sighted to get rid of school libraries. So, but the library of the future, and I think what people are already talking about is that the library of the future is a place where it's about accessing information um, not necessarily as books, but as electronic information. Some, you know, some libraries are really experimenting with um, things like game worlds and virtual spaces and that, that kind of stuff. Um, they're very much at the forefront of figuring out how to transition into the next phase, I think. Uh, yes? Sorry. When you were talking about um, the situation in the art of cheap digital and uh, whatever, it struck me that the, the role of existing media will become one of aggregator of information, and that from the consumer's point of view, I will subscribe to or, or purchase the aggregator services that are most relevant to me. Then I started thinking, well, isn't that always what traditional media have done, is that of aggregating information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that the aggregation is, um, is a really important function. Um, I think there, uh, you're also seeing journalism experiment with um, different ways of contextualizing and recontextualizing that. So there's this whole area, as, you, as I'm sure you know, in data journalism and taking the incredibly large data sets that are available. You know, so maybe it's you know maybe the New York City government has an interest in making certain types of data uh, available, but maybe the role for the journalist is to compare the data that the New York City government makes public with what they don't make public, you know, like what happened in the budget year or whatever, you know, coming, bring these things together in new and interesting ways. Um, the New York Times has done some incredible work with data visualization where they're thinking about, um, and this is, an, I think, a really good example of thinking of new approaches to storytelling that take advantage of the fact that we now have these incredible amounts of data. So what they're doing is creating, um, you know, wonderful graphs that bring together, like they had this one that uh, the New York Times did. I saw a documentary about it, about it, about data visualization. This is my life. I watch documentaries about data visualization. Uh, <laughs> and they had one right after the financial crisis hit in the States. And it was a wonderful graph where you could see the overall unemployment rate. And then as you scrolled your mouse along it, you could see the line of the graph depending on where you were, different subsectors of, of um, the population. So if you were um, an African American male with high school education, if you were um, a middle-aged woman with um, some university education, et cetera, et cetera. And it was an incredibly compelling way of demonstrating the differential effects that the financial crisis was having on people of um, different, uh, different parts of the culture. And that's an example, I think, of saying, well, maybe the most effective way to wrangle data is no longer just to sort of tell one particular story or to tell it in a conventional narrative form, but to think of like, okay, the best way to tell the story of data is with those visuals. Um, so I think, I think that absolutely the aggregation and, and you know, a journalist, for instance, or a media professional's ability to say, these are the, what I think are the interesting, incredible sources of information. Or even if you think about something that happens in a crisis situation, like when, um, 
you know, when the crisis happened in Haiti, there were certain people who emerged pretty quickly as being um, pretty clear aggregators themselves of information of what was going on. There was a guy named Carol Pedre, who's a, a morning show host in Port-au-Prince, who emerged as one of those people. And then through that kind of bottom-up process that happens on something like Twitter, then you know journalists could link to him and he could be linked to other people. And so that's a way that I think you know, even in a rapidly evolving situation, we can start to serve as helpful aggregators of information and pointing people to good information. And I think it's when a crisis really happens, when information is changing very quickly and when it's very un uncertain, that's where you do see people turning to um, you know, CBC or whatever, or individuals even that they know that they can really trust to be those aggregators. and loves long-form journalism. It's, I mean, I'm with you in being saddened by it, for sure. Um, and I think that, that the, you know, the me journalism, I think a lot of ways is really driven by the business model problems. Like, it's cheaper to do me journalism than it is to do investigative or contextual journalism, right? I think um, it's interesting that you mentioned the question of, of process and context. One of the experiments that I've seen um, done is actually experimenting with creating game worlds as a way of telling stories, where you actually, um, I wish I could remember the name of this journalist. We did a thing with him on Spark. He's a journalism prof who teaches, um, he calls it news games. So he teaches how to make game, essentially video games that explain news stories. Um, and his thinking is that game worlds are actually really good for explaining those process questions, like for explaining um, you know, what happened in the financial collapse, because you can put people in situations and allow them to explore a system. Um, so the answer might partly be in maybe there are other ways beyond long-form linear uh, narrative that we're used to thinking of for explaining those kind of contextual things. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not totally sanguine about this stuff. Like, I can't help but be saddened by the, what seems like the death of long-form linear journalism, because I think there are things that that does very well. Um, yeah, beyond that, I don't have an answer. But I do, I do think where you're starting to see people try to adapt that is in these two worlds of uh, gaming journalism and data journalism, as I suggested. Um. <coughs> No, the, the YouTube video you showed that was actually a commercial. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we, we now can't really tell who's paying for what. Um, and you can't tell in journalism either who's paying. If you've got all these independent journalists, you, you can't always see where the money is. Um, in fact, you gave the story of the good journalist who's at someplace else, who's, who's got another boss, but really has his own credibility and his own sort of uh, subscribers, so to speak. That's a good example, but there are a lot of journalists, for example, who actually, you can't tell where the money is behind them um, because they can hide their blog behind. Everything, <coughs> you know, everybody can be bought and sold, including a journalist. So can you talk a little bit about sort of commercialization and, and journalism, and the celebrity of the journalist and all the problems that come with around ethics and, and, and money? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly in the, early go in the early going with blogs, because people were writing blogs who hadn't necessarily had the you know, journalism ethics training, there wasn't really the sort of 
clarity of like, okay, you're doing an advertorial here, you need to declare, you need to be upfront. So much uh, to the point that I think about five years ago, there was talk about having a sort of code of ethics for bloggers. Um, I think that as blogging, or a certain, at least a certain strata of blogging, is becoming more professionalized, there's a little more awareness around that, at least in terms of full disclosure, of saying, hey, this is an advertisement, you know, like, um, what some blogs do now is they do, um, they get people to sponsor their RSS feed. And so that involves essentially nothing except that, you know, at the end of the week where you sponsor the RSS feed, the blogger will do a write up that says, this week's RSS feed is sponsored by blah, 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 blah. This is why I like it, da, 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 da. I mean, maybe it's a bit iffy from a conventional journalistic point of view, but at least it's clear, right? It's contained in a little uh, box. I think that one way that that will maybe happen in, in terms of the integrity and the transparency and the credibility is simply over time. Um, you know, I think that it's difficult maybe to, it's not difficult for the purposes of one story to conceal where your money is coming from, but I think over time as you become one of those trusted people, it may be more difficult to conceal that um, because the growing expectation is that you're going to be transparent. Um, I don't think there are easy answers around that. I think you're absolutely right that, you know, independent journalism and the pressures just to, you know, pay your damn rent if you're trying to do it on your own um, are pretty intense. So I agree that there's a real problem there. Um, but I do think that, you know, as I suggested, because there's such a need to be, um, because the bar, in fact, is higher if you're going to be sort of self-employed, if you're going to be independent of the institution. I think it's uh, incumbent on people, at, at the very least, to be transparent about it, even if you know they don't happen to have a trust fund that's allowing them to be, you know, completely independent bloggers. <coughs> yes, you seem to be kind of in the position. You came from more traditional media. You probably have friends that are still in traditional media, and then you dive into this new ecosystem that's your play. I'd be curious if you think that people you know from past that are still in the traditional media can adapt to what you see as the new world if, if they seem to be able to understand the ecosystem or they're just so in bed that you don't think they can kind of make a shift. I think, I mean what I see is I think that everybody recognizes that change is happening and that they need to respond to it. Um, so I don't think it's like where we were at, you know, five years ago where it wasn't unusual to hear people say, oh, vlogs, you know, it's people saying what they had for lunch. Like, I think people have got beyond that. Um, I think if what I'm suggesting is true, I think the requirement to change story is pretty deep and pretty intense, and you have to be he heavily motivated to do it. And I think it's harder to do it if you've been trained in a certain way and you've become used to a certain way of telling stories. That said, I, ha I have to say as a radio person, we're really seeing, at least within CBC, the podcast world really take off. And that is a world where people, because, because it's appointment listening, they're really making a decision to listen to something and they're giving it their, they're making a decision to subscribe, they're making a decision when they're going to listen to it. It's not like radio where you turn it on while your head's in the oven cleaning the oven or whatever. You know, you're usually pretty focused on that world. It does offer some pretty amazing opportunities for um, really intimate, sustained storytelling. Um, that, I think, is a really interesting, hopeful window. The way you tell story in a podcast form, I think, is still different from the way you tell it in a radio form. It's a lot more intimate. It's a lot um, closer. But I, I think that's a place where some of what radio does really, really well, documentary and that kind of thing, can really live. Um, and live in a way that's, you know, obviously it's a lot cheaper to make an audio documentary than it is to make a vi visual documentary. Um, as to whether people can adapt, I'm not, I'm not, super confident. I think what I've seen is a lot of people saying, kind of saying, oh, we have to do this. And that's why I talk about the, you know, the fact of like people reading tweets in the newscast or whatever. That, I mean, it's fine, I understand that, and, and you should probably be doing that. But if you think that's addressing what the new challenges are, then that's not good enough, I don't think. Yes? I'm curious about this 
One thing that I'm interested in, I'm not a journalist, I'm a biologist, <laughs> but is trying to find these hubs of credibility. And I find that it's so labor intensive at this point that I, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at current events, I, you know, I go back to the CBC because, or the newspaper, because it's easy and it has some credibility. So I'm curious, where do you see this going? Like, what is going to unify this information so that people can readily find these hubs of credibility? Mm -hmm. Well, as I, I think, as with most things online, um, the answer is, less, is that they're, they're sort of emerging from the bottom up in, in a way. I think there are a lot of um, there are a lot of people who are paying a lot of attention to this because I think everybody recognizes that this is kind of crazy. We can't go on like this, right? We're going to drown in tweets at this point. So there there is a lot of energy being put into how we can make that um, a little more. Um, a little bit easier for people to do along the lines of, you know, to use Anna Gerdardes' example of Swift River <coughs> and trying to um, evaluate information so that the credible stuff rises to the, to the top and so that you don't have to go through and find the credible information that it comes to you um, more, um, more readily. Um, we are seeing, a, there are a lot of startups that are trying to do this, trying to find ways of evaluating information. Um, but a, a lot of them also rely, as so many things in the Web 2.0 world do, on us contributing for free, our labor, to try and sort that out, right? Like, one of the things that people in, in my world are really excited about is, is Quora, which is supposed to be a way of getting in-depth, sophisticated information that's actually written by humans who are experts in the area, which I can see why I would want to be a member of Quora because that's who doesn't want you know expert information written written by credible people on topics that you're interested in, right? <laughs> but the question for me is, okay, you know, like I looked at Quora, I signed up because I signed up for everything, mm -hmm. uh, and then I thought this looks like a just a times so I'm gonna have to quit my job if I start participating in this because that's it's very labor intensive to contribute that information, right? Um, so again, no easy answers, but I think there's a lot of energy being put into how that's going to be. Um, done more 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 easily for for average users because and and I think in a way I mean that may be some of the saving uh, grace for things like CBC is that it is a place that can be an aggregator that can be um, a hub as I've been using that term um, and you know maybe the answer lies partly in us because we're professionals in serving that role of bringing together that information and acting as that and playing that role for our interested users. Except that maybe you're not just getting, you know, this is Spark, this is Nora, or this is CBC Journalist. Maybe you're getting CBC Journalist plus the other people in this ecosystem that we recognize and see as um, value added for the people who choose to follow us. Nora, you talked about the daily pothole blog and yes. how does the journalist compete with that? And then uh, you went on to say that perhaps a journalist's job is to find out what they're not telling us. Yeah. We talked about the digital information officer. Um, as a journalist and as a broadcast educator, I've watched the media become less and less engaged right across the board, no matter which platform you're talking about, in investigative journalism. And that concerns me. A lot of it is just regurgitating what a PR person has, has given them. Um, what are your thoughts on investigative journalism as we move down the road? Because everybody wants quick now, tell me in you know 144 characters or whatever, and and I that's a concern for me. I'm wondering if it is for you as well. Oh yeah, I mean it's really a concern for me, and I think that's you know it's nice to talk about media and stuff, but that's where it actually hits the road in terms of having an effect on democracy and, and politics, right? I mean that's that's the really really important work of journalism. I think that, you know, to me it seems like the appetite for journalists to do that sort of stuff is still there. And I think the potential for finding new ways to tell those stories, say for example in a, in a really good visualization or something, I think those tools are there. I think the problem is that the business model is under, under such stress that, you know, it's easier to pay a columnist to say what they think than it is to pay somebody to go out and research something and investigate for weeks and weeks or months. Um, I think that there have been some good examples of um, newspapers, and who knows if they'll stick with this, sort of trying to target something and really doing a focused journalism in a way that um, 
that will let them make the most out of that. Like the Globe and Mail has been doing some series where they'll really focus a lot of attention on a particular area. And usually it's something that's not uh, specifically time sensitive. So that, I and I imagine what they're thinking is that at least this way it can live on the web. Or the Wall Street Journal did a wonderful series called What They Know, which was basically about all of the, the data mining that's going on when you're contributing information and when you're traveling around the web. And they put it into a great package, which wasn't, you know, in its entirety, there was an enormous amount of information there, and it was really good information. But they didn't do it in the traditional, long-form journalistic way. It was kind of d divided up into chunks that lived in a sort of a separate um, page, a separate special page. So I think, I think the tools are there to still do that. I think you probably have to think about ways to do it other than the conventional, you know, New Yorker style long form piece. I think the question is really, the f it's the funding really, I think that's the challenge. But I, I mean, I talk to young journalists, as I'm sure you do, who, who would love to do that stuff, but they just don't see, and that's the scary thing, is you have to be a really top flight journalist, as you know, to do that, but it's really, I mean, if getting a job in journalism is hard, getting a job as an investigative journalist is really, really hard. Right? Yeah. The other side of the coin is how many people in the younger generation are interested and willing to read long-form journalism or to consume investigative journalism when they can get a 10-second clip online or they can get somebody's tweet which tells them all they think they need to know. I got a, a link to a long news story from a friend the other day that had um, TL, comma, DR, colon, and then a one, which is too long, didn't read, and then a one sentence line of the summary of what was in the article that they linked to me, which I thought was kind of funny um, and distressing at the same time. Um, I didn't like, I, for, well, first of all, I'd be interested to know what you observe with your students. I mean, do they have an appetite for reading long? They don't have an appetite for reading that. No, is that the general consensus that they're not interested in the long reads? Yeah. Nobody's willing to read it. Yeah. Business model won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's depressing. Yeah. yeah. That's our goal. What's that? That's our goal as educators, I think. I think that's our goal is to get them thinking more deeply and reading more deeply. And it's a struggle. Isn't that what education is like? Yeah. I think, I think if they're engaged, they will. But I mean, the bulk of their discussions with their friends are 140 characters or much less, sometimes just symbols, you know, colon, bracket, for a happy face, you know, so their, their discussions are so small now, and, but unless they're extremely engaged in the topic that you're talking about, they, 140 <laughs> characters is long form journalism. <laughs> is how, like, is it possible to, we were talking about this, uh, we were talking about this last night, actually, is whether it's possible to do something that's in-depth but not linear, right? Is it, is, is it that they don't want to go in-depth, or is it that they don't want to pursue something in a, in a linear kind of way? I mean, I, I know for myself, because I spend so much time online, and it's, I don't say this without shame, but if I'm just sitting with a book, reading for pleasure, like not taking notes, not doing it for an interview or anything, I find it really hard to just sit and concentrate. And it's absolutely terrifying to me. That, but that's the reality, right? I can't I just, I'm used to things going all over the place. And it's like, it's rewiring my brain to work that way. Um, so I think the question is, do we have to, is that something that we just have to resist and say, no, we are going to lose depth if we don't keep teaching ourselves and training ourselves to follow something in a linear way, or is there a way that we can still have depth <laughs> without being linear? That's an, I don't know what the answer is, but interesting question. I don't know how much of where my colleagues are with this, but you know, the, 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 the hundred times that I might walk into a classroom at the beginning of a class on any given day, and the, the lids are up, and people are gathered around watching something on video, it's some body gross thing about how some guy at a county fair in Kentucky ate 62 hot dogs and what he did afterwards, and then just getting a laugh out of it. And, and it kind of made me think uh, about one of the things that I do at the very, very beginning on the first day of the first class in the first semester when I ask people what do they think a story is. 
and that I would assert to them, and hope that they would possibly embrace it, is that a story makes us feel something. We feel emotional, we feel anger, we feel pride, we feel sensitive, we feel vulnerable. And uh, I, I'm just wondering how all of that fits into you know, your leisure time when you can't stay with that book. Is it because you're not feeling anything? What's happening to us? Are we becoming desensitized? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if you think about, think about that video that went, um, went around uh, after the um, protests in Tehran in 2009, you know, the, the woman who, um, who was shot, that was certainly a very widely seen video that had obviously a, a you know, terrible emotional punch. It certainly wasn't um, silly, right? I mean, it was powerful and, and important that it be seen. Um, but do you, are you asking, like, do you think is, is, are we now so connected to just what's visceral that we're losing touch with what's more um, cerebral and not? It, it's hard. I think what I'm wondering about is, and I don't ask myself this question, I never just put it up on my students, is uh, what is it that makes me feel something anymore? You know, in terms of like, what am I watching? What am I reading? What am I taking in? Uh, whether it's 144 characters or it's a, you know, 400 pages, you know, a 400 page novel. What is it that makes me feel something? And it seems like that's an important question to remind ourselves to ask from time to time as we kind of fly through this stuff at, uh, you know, breakneck speed. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think speed has a, a big role to play in it. I, I actually played a, um, an online video game recently, very, very simple interface, and it was designed to teach you about, um, I guess it could be used as an anti-bullying tool, but it was designed to teach you about social exclusion. And you're just, you're literally just this dot, and you go with your mouse, you know, you, you follow, you become this dot, and you're going up, and you meet all these other little collections of dots that are in different patterns, and as you approach it, as approach each of these collections of dots, they, they spray off and, and go away from you. And it goes on for, you know, maybe two minutes, this very simple little interface. And I was playing it, and I'd be playing it, and before long I realized I was starting to cry, like, because it was such an emotional experience of social rejection. Of, and it's like, it literally was these black dots on a white background, you know, it was really <laughs> incredibly powerful. But I think a lot of it had to do with, um, you know, great, that's great storytelling, right? If you can tell a great storytelling that teaches a lesson with a bunch of dots, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. But also, I think the fact that it slowed me down and it immersed me in this one experience and it allowed it to unfold over time was really important. And that, I think, you know, just to get back to the podcast thing, for me, I think, is some of the real value of what podcasts can do because they are linear and because they do slow down and they can let the story breathe and so forth, that you can take people on a a journey, which I think is so much of what we don't get, right? You get a little snippet or whatever, but you don't, you don't get taken on a journey. You don't go anywhere um, spiritually or even intellectually often. So one last question. Sessions Going back to the Tehran video, I think the disturbing thing is that a lot of people uh, will watch that and they may read a one sentence caption and they think they know the story and it gets back to the comment about context. but they don't even realize they're not getting the context. They think that is the story, that's it. I don't need to know anymore. Yeah. yeah. And that's scary. Yeah, it is scary. And especially when you think about something like the YouTube video of Times Square, right? It's like, how do you, if you don't know the context, how can you start to evaluate the quality of the information that you're getting when it's so easy to manipulate it? Exactly, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. My gift of our appreciation. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going to begin to answer my telephone with Ahoy! <laughs> Let's bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Nora.